Hello and welcome to Imp's WWE Adventures podcast on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. You can help the network out by leaving us a five-star review. You can also give a donation directly through Red Circle and become one of the amazing community by joining the Social Suplex Discord. Link is in the description. Listen to the other top-notch shows here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Wrestling Art with Chris Things, Trish and Sarah, Tunnel Talk, and Sam Brown is back with the AEW Match Guide with the first episode with Trish from Trish and Sarah Podcast. Also, a congratulations to Rich as well being featured on the new AEW album. Give him his champagne. <laughs> Give him his awards. <laughs> Sam says it all the time on his podcast, but I'm just going to echo it here. It feels like uh, such a privilege to be part of this network right now, with all the additions that came in. There's a new life that's coming into this network as well. I feel, it feels really great to be part of the Social Suplex Network right now. My name is Matt Mayer, a.k.a. Imp, and this is your quick look back at the WWE week that was. I drew the short straw. <laughs> 30 minutes is about as much as minutes of wrestling i got to talk about this week, a.k.a. half of Friedman Osprey. <laughs> so anyway, let's jump on over very, very quickly to... Worcester. How did you say? Did you say it's War Worcester? Because it, it's, it's Worcester over here. <laughs> but the spelling is it, is it Worcester or War? I don't know. You say it in America, you weirdos. <laughs> you say you take out the name of our places and then you say them wrong. <laughs> anyway, it was oh, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. <laughs> let's go. Let's go over to there. <laughs> the, the, the complete wrong way of saying it. Anyway, let's go over to Massachusetts for Friday Night SmackDown. <laughs> Or was the Samoan werewolf doing the bidding of the new tribal chief, the new shot caller, Solo Sokoa? Cody Rhodes versus Solo Sokoa is set for SummerSlam to the tune of We Want Roman to really put in perspective the entire point of the storyline, which made me think it might not have been a bad idea to have this at a pay-per-view before SummerSlam. So they can do so as a co versus very much at SummerSlam, but I get the entire point is they're saving that late for, I don't know, war games? They're going to probably do an old bloodline versus new bloodline. It's in the back of my mind that they might do Team Cody versus Team Sokoa, but it, it, it just screams that we're just waiting for Roman, and the longer you, you prolong that, the less you can, dividends you're going to be able to get from it. As amazing as Fatu is, <laughs> I feel like the Sokoa group is ready for whatever the next thing after the Cody feud is because it feels like we're ready for that Roman return even though uh, it's predictable isn't always bad but it's that thing of because of all the foreshadowing things laid on the ground it's like yeah that's fine that's fine whatever when you get to this point and it's quite clear the investment isn't quite there in Sokoa I wouldn't delay it past SummerSlam <laughs> it hasn't got the legs this kind of thing for like you can test it whether what well, direction you want to go I'm assuming they know what they're doing for war games so with that in mind I don't really have to worry about, oh, what are they going to do with this? It goes that way, that way. They've already decided it's just up to them to paint all the different possible roads we could go down. For me, that's when wrestling's at its best, which tries to convince you of all the different routes being great roads to go down. Then it doesn't really matter which one they pick. I feel like the crowd has read for a very long time. <laughs> this is all building to Roman Reigns interfering and taking back the bloodline. And then he could do a new bloodline versus old bloodline match at War Games. And also, that could not happen. And he could just do Team Cody versus Team Sokoa. That said, the legs on this are already buckling a bit. <laughs> As in, it's not it's not too visible. It's not too bad. The donkey's still riding. <laughs> but we're not going to get to Cairo. <laughs> it's not happening. It's really not happening. Why am I riding a donkey in Egypt? <laughs> the metaphor died. <laughs> oh, well, maybe the metaphor's for perfect. Because you really shouldn't be riding a donkey. You need a camel. You need a Cody camel. You need an actual camel. <laughs> you need Roman Reigns and Cody. They're camels. <laughs> we can't break their own camel backs. So we can break a donkey back. <laughs> anyway, quick, uh, just moving on I've past the, the donkey bit. Let's actually talk about what happened in the segment with Cody Rhodes and Solo Sokoa this week on SmackDown. Solo with a promo talking about picking up the bloodline after Roman went soft. Last week was about building the tag division that had with the DIY title win. This week, we've immediately got the set that back, right? Uh, Gargano and Ciampa retained, but Fatu came out and destroyed them afterwards. Hey, showcasing Fatu is never a bad thing, mind you. He's easily the best part of this act. I like the I like the essence. I like the idea of Tamatonga and his character. One of the things is that I've seen him be a little more, but the fact that they've got Fatu as the generally unhinged one, I like the idea of he had Tamatonga and he was built as this kind of scary guy that shouldn't have been allowed into the company. But he was just a prelude to Fatu, who is genuinely unhinged. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I don't mind him as a little precursor to Fatu. It kind of works in that way. But the group, but I feel like so Sokoa, when I say his character is the weak point, I don't mean as a wrestler. I've seen some people criticise him as a wrestler. Like, as like, for me, as a wrestler in the WWE sphere, he's fine. 
it's, it's fine, it's whatever. It's not AEW, it doesn't matter as much. If you can put in the character work behind it and you just, uh, you can nail it with all the production if you put all the effort in and someone will get over in WWE completely different. It's a completely different world to AEW. However, <laughs> and it's my main critique still, because they didn't put in the effort beforehand, they've had to do the convincing you that he should be a leader of this thing whilst they're trying to build the group around him, rather than having already convinced you we should get a group behind him, then you see it happen, so you're kind of wanting it to see it happen, but even if he's the villain. Because yeah, that's the thing with me with WWE. I really felt it watching Will Ospreay MGF this week, where MGF goes through a fist bump in the crowd and instead he gets a middle finger. Obviously, it's a different attitude and way that the fans are in on watching the product and the accent and everything. Is the relationship between the rest of the fans is different in AW and WWE. However, in WWE... CM Punk can go to Scotland and cost their hero the win and he'll get requests for selfies and fist bumps. There, there is no such thing as a wrestler who's genuinely hated in WWE. No one's anywhere near that level. My point being that Solo hasn't got that hatred behind him even though he's getting the we want Roman chance. <laughs> that's, that's more become of that's the thing you chant during his matches rather than him being genuinely hated. Like Dom isn't genuinely hated. They have fun booing him and that's the bit. They don't actually hate him. But with the Solo stuff... He's, he's, the, he's clearly the villain of the piece, but isn't like that much heat behind him. And when Roman comes back, I feel like the tie's just far more stronger with all of the bloodline stuff. And then you have Jimmy Uso returning too. You can m- maybe, in my mind, you also bring back Jay. And you have all of them linked together. Build to it, though. <laughs> it's not till November is War Games. If he returns August 3rd for SummerSlam, and then you got you got like three, four months to build up <laughs> them actually all teaming together. This all was leading right into the main event angle. Solo officially set his sights on the undisputed WWE Championship. The quick aside, there's two world titles. It's literally disputed. So it's not an undisputed championship because there's literally two world titles. I digress. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Cody cutting to the chase as both he and Solo want the same match at SummerSlam, boldly saying if it were up to him, he'd want the fight right here, right now, when surrounded by four beefy lads. Bringing the ball, obviously Cody started to get beaten up. But it's Fatu who is the different maker. Randy Pandy out for the save, but again it's Fatu with the super kick before a damn impressive suicida. Cody trapped in the ropes like late career Andre the Giant and forced to watch the bloodline beat up Paul Vandal Keith. Three man powerbomb through the announce table. Simone spiked to the chap Cody, going off air with wands raised once again. And that was your little convincing just sending us right into the match at SummerSlam. And after we've seen all the promotional material come out, so Sokoa is the main image for the poster for SummerSlam in his car with everybody. Uh, sure, the dimensions a little bit off, and Tamatonga looks like a tiny person in a booster seat, but <laughs> you know, they've got the, uh, it's, all about, it's all about the new bloodline. And as well, getting your official match graphics and everything put out there, Cody versus Sokoa is all over the place. That is the big thing that they are promoting. I look at it and I'm just like, the main problem with this entire feud is you're just waiting for Roman Reigns. It's almost like watching a uh, yeah, no DQ match and everyone's just chanting, we want tables. It doesn't matter the story you're telling. All they want to see is the table explode at that point. <laughs> they need to get the table out. They're not even paying attention to your story at that point. <laughs> WWE conditioned responses. They were of their era, but they don't they don't belong in the current era. It's the kind of chant that you do when the actual product itself isn't that interesting or entertaining, so there's no point you really get invested in the match. But it's just become a chant that you do at wrestling shows because that's what you do at wrestling shows. And AEW's just not been able to shake them. But it's a WWE conditioned thing where We Want Tables is for any match that is no DQ. It doesn't matter the stipulation. It doesn't matter if it's a Money in the Bank that's been an established ladder match for two decades. It doesn't matter. Now every single one. And every single no DQ match gets a We Want Tables chant. Every single time. <laughs> it's a conditioned response which I'd like to go away. But I don't think is that and what are the two chants. Those two. <laughs> Those are the two I want to go away. I feel like what is the more important to address, <laughs> really. I think every time I talk about this, at the end I'm just like, you know, maybe don't want the foreigners. Just a thought. Tiffany Strasson kicked off the show as a miss and money in the bank, calling out the champions and top lasses. The content of her promo is unfortunately generic as hell, but Strasson's delivery is just so spot on for her character that I really didn't mind. It's like it's less turning shit into gold, more paper into something airable on television. <laughs> like, it's, like it's still like it's still it's still not great, but you know it doesn't feel like I'm watching generic awfulness because it's her, even though I, the words she's saying are generic. Heard it a million times. The way she says it is uh, makes it all work. Bailey out to step to her face to face as champion, and then Nia Jax steps to her face, bringing up the past two matches from NXT in 2017. Bailey also noting on Nia having lost the title before through cash in, which is a nice little touch. But this isn't the same Bailey from back then. This is a much more confident veteran champion. 
kind of similar road we've seen with Sami Zayn as well. Two NXT people of that similar era who were somewhat booked as the lovable underdogs, then turned heel for a lengthy period, and now they're beloved big faces yet again, but as veteran and kind of confident champions. Nia proposes to call this version of Bailey BBL Bailey. I'm not translating that. Stay innocent, wrestling fans. <laughs> Nia Jax versus Amir Yim. Yim out for the two-on-one baddie save. Good to see her performances as of late rewarded, even if she is the fourth wheel to take the pins. The match including a lot of Nia wiggling and showing Bailey her butt. Like, is this is this title match becoming driven by booty envy? Mia getting in a tad too much offence, so Tiffy slides in a kendo stick, initially accidentally working distraction the wrong way into a spur of Yim offence, but in the end, the Queen of the Ring gets to sit on her for the win. I don't know what a finisher is called, because it's not called the I'm going to sit on you, <laughs> but I don't actually know what it's called. Stratton and Jack's team together beat up the champion after the match, the crowd chanting, cash it in, as we get our first properties of the Tiffy cash-in. Anyway, other notes. Big Banter Corbs and Cruz got their match with Angel and Berto. They lost. LA Knight got his contract for his match with Logan Paul, playing the footage of him pinning the US champion in his Money in the Bank qualifying match as the logic. And Blair Davenport got a Wii showcase against Naomi. A say showcase. Naomi won, but after the break, Naomi bumped into her WrestleMania tag partners Belair and Cargill before bumping into Davenport, who shook her hand. In a ruse! Well, after she walked away and he got Naomi, because uh, Chelsea Green and Piper Niven walked out of the uh, empty GM's office, which was a, a little comedy art that ran throughout the show, that distraction of them walking past her was enough to get driven by Blair Devonport. There's a lot of like, little generic stuff, but performed relatively better than we've seen it over the years. So even though it's generic and it kind of feels generic, you're not watching it and going, oh, that's generic. But you know it is. That, that tick in your brain, that box in your brain is being ticked, but you don't really mind it. And I think a big part of that is just the overall improvement in competency in every single ounce of production for the product. Be that writing, be that the actual visual direction changes and different camera things that we're seeing. All of that stuff really, really does feed. It means the minuses across the show don't impede your enjoyment as much as they did during the previous era, where there were so many minuses it was all you could see, all that your attention was thinking about afterwards. What's now? Yeah, like, yeah, there's a few minuses, but it's still fine. <laughs> Either that, or I'm getting older and I'm turning full Dave Meltzer. <laughs> like, if you actually listen to any of Dave Meltzer's reviews, especially in that Vince era, about five, six years ago, we still got the exact same amount of flack. Like, pre-AEW, there was still the exact same amount of flack against Meltzer. And I remember at the time, people were just like, yeah, but if you actually listen to his reviews, it'll be a lot like, eh, it's fine. Here's what it is. Talking about the dire 2019, <laughs> which is not a good period of WWE. The period of WWE now is able to call itself so much improved and so much better because of what it was. <laughs> what it was was dog shit. <laughs> what it was was so bad that it created a whole other company and further for wrestling to be different. <laughs> a whole other company happened because of how bad <laughs> that show was. I mean, obviously, other places also started doing it good. Can't take away their efforts. Across the indie scene, across Japan, across all all the different aspects of the wrestling world. I mean, the UK until WWE killed it. But, yeah, but it, it was so, so bad. And Dave Meltzer would, in, in, still in his reviews, would just be like, eh, you know, here's what it is. <laughs> it's like, maybe I'm reaching that point. <laughs> maybe that's where I've got to. Anyway, that is Smackdown. Not really a lot to talk about. I mean, I've got plenty full of notes for Raw. Uh, so let's jump on over to Monday Night Raw. And, op- and op- kind of like an opposite of last week, where it felt like I had like little points to talk about with Raw and Smackdown. T- and, well, I had Money in the Bank, didn't I? Anyway, let's jump on over to Monday Night Raw. Rhea Ripley is back, thank Christ. <laughs> I just want to say really, really quickly, the presentation and making her the main character instantly, really smart decision. In terms of WWE going forward, framing her this importantly and like this is absolutely massive for both uh, the brand of WWE and for, I guess for like more to have somebody like this that they can focus everything about. Because Becky Lynch was like a megastar, but it still felt like there was a push back against her getting that slot. And then even though it felt like more like, like, fine, we'll give you Becky kind of thing. A similar thing to with Daniel Bryan, like, fine, we'll give you Daniel Bryan. Like, this is what you want, clearly. Then the show's kind of been based around her a bit. I think the, the evidence of the pushback was they wanted to do Ronda Rousey, Charlotte Flair, and did everything they could to still do that match. But the fans were like, nah. Nah. So even though the focus was around Becky Lynch, they were also putting the focus around Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey, like these other stars. Whilst it feels like here, Triple H fully understands, no, 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 they want Ray Ripley. 
let's just give them Rhea Ripley, make her the focus, make her the through line of the show. And part of me is just like, why not just try and, for the first time in WWE history, actually make a women's star a sen- like the central character? They're doing a pretty good job at generating stars at the moment. Everybody's over. And they get into that point where they're just over time building the prestige of all these stars in this kind of over feeling period. They've generated Cody, obviously. A lot of the character work has been done in AEW, so he's a, he pretty much arrived in WWE, a finished product. Ray Ripley's now at a point, she's returned from an injury, and somewhat similar to Cody, her character is ready. And you can now build the entire show around her. The fans are that desperate to see her. Obviously, this is her returning, so there's that desperation to see her. There's the longing after not <laughs> seeing on TV for a while. But this show, being framed on Ray Ripley, was so perfect. <laughs> that is the note. That is the massive positive I take away from it. And of course, the way that we're filming her, the way that they, when I say captured their her aura, it was designed for it to be there. <laughs> but the way that they gave the platform for it to be displayed, I thought it done really, really well. Before we got into the, like the main point of the show, we got a v- a VTR play play on Liv Morgan and Ray Ripley recapping the entire storyline, sexual harassment and all. And it transitioned amazingly into Rhea Ripley walking through backstage. Well, actually, first of all, Rhea Ripley elevator door opening and she just does like a cheeky finger wink to the crowd. Beckons uses the camera to follow her through Gorilla, setting her sights on her World Women's Championship and Liv Morgan. Instead getting Dom with a rose. Uh, She didn't even mention your mate. Not even the point of this promo. Liv appearing on the screen, telling dirty little lies, points at the lawsuit sign, lying about having sex with Dom, if it keeps pointing at the sign. Ripley just basically ignoring it all and challenging the last for SummerSlam. Uh, an actually interesting Liv character beat as she accepts all serious for a second. And I was talking about last week that I felt like this story and I was doing Liv quite a strong disservice for the talent I feel like she's become. Because every single time I'm watching the Liv stuff, it's just... <laughs> I can't turn off the part of my brain that's just been just like, oh, this, is, this is such a story written through a male gaze, being like, oh, look, look, she's hot, isn't she? Don't you want to be in Don's position or something like that? Or oh, it's like the male fantasy or <laughs> something like that. And in my, I can't not compare it to the women's title match in AEW, which absolutely screams that it was not written that way at all. And, uh, <laughs> and I loved how they go uh, on that, like for people who know that they're just doing the film all about Eve. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and it's like, it's all about Mariah. It's like, oh, that's an absolutely perfect note. But yeah, so just like seeing two women's title match storylines who, who I feel like if they were written by the different f- f- sides of each other, they would feel so different in terms of like what the actual focus of the storylines actually feels like it has been. It, f- it just feels like there's such a focus on the sexualization side of the Liv Morgan Ray Ripley Dom storyline, whilst in the AEW storyline, you-, you can't lie that. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's stuff in there, but it's so much more tastefully done, and it's so not the focus. <laughs> like it's just a part of the storyline, and it's treated as somewhat. When I say more like adult content, for me, this is what it kind of means. Where it's just like, no, no, no. It's a kind of storyline that can be more appreciated because it's being more adult. Not the, <laughs> not saying that oh, we're gonna do swearing and blood. Like no, no. Storylines like this make WWE feel childish. That's what I mean. <laughs> uh, the AW Women's Championship match is a storyline for adults, whilst WWE's one is for teenagers and kids. <laughs> That's what it feels like when I'm watching it. Rhea having none of Don, but immediately cool with the rest. Speaking of, why is Carlito hanging out in our clubhouse? Throughout the show, Dom trying to speak to Rhea, who just keeps making it very plain and simple. Look at the damage Liv's games are having on Dom. Point at the sign. When the focus becomes, look at the damage you're having on Dom. Male gaze, points at sign. <laughs> I wasn't expecting the night to curtail into reminding us Jey Uso has always been horny for Ripley. Priest using the opportunity to manipulate Dom into making the night even worse for himself by losing to Us. Liv saving Dom from a splash, and Oost dropkick sending us into one more Dom and Liv awkward ringside spot. My god, I don't think I've ever had to point at the sign so many times in one night, points at the sign again. Everything ending alright on the night though. Turns out Dom's okay after spiralling down into embarrassment because he's a sub. Ray Ripley being just like, I don't belong to anybody because you belong to me. And just, and just the way that Dom smiles afterwards has been, has been just like, just a re-establishing of their relationship. Because throughout the night, Damien Peter's been toying with Dom Mysterio. You can't let Jey Uso talk to you like that. Like, you were in prison. I did, that callback didn't make me laugh. <laughs> like, you were in prison. You can't let someone just say that about you. Like, you you challenged him to a match. And he's like, yeah, 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 throughout the match with Jey Uso. He's just been like, uh, Ray, she's, ma- mommy's mine. <laughs> Ray Ripley's mine. And, like, and all that stuff. I felt like 
at the end of the night, the reason I wasn't doing like a like massively kind of critique commentary on the Damien Priest stuff with this was more that I felt like at the end of the night, Rhea Ripley, she became the one in actual control of everything <laughs> and her re- re-establishing control of both the, uh, her faction and both her status on my late was like a main central character. I felt like this show did all of that really, really well. And we got to see Liv actually be serious for a second, which I felt like was the most important thing. Then her actual physical appearance on the show was the, the same beat again. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I thought with everybody coming back, we'd be moving past that beat, unless this was like one more for the road, Glenn. <laughs> Just one more. I feel like that's quite a decent way to transition into Gunter and Damien Priest. Because this Monday Night Raw was a good show for promos, a bad show for in-ring wrestling, a, a quiet crowd too, like larger than an AEW telly attendant, but quieter. And that's with better sound production as well. Like, sure, you got the numbers on them, but the crowd were sat on their hands. Like, I, it doesn't really matter if you got more butts in the seats. I guess technically the sound audio would be less accurate, but they're not really making any noise. They're not massively invested in the show. So anyway, Gunter and Damien Priest. Some really great lines here. Gunter got a video package earlier, and one of the lines that really took out, it was never my dream to be here. Dreams are a waste of time. Just an amazing VTR promo from Gunter, slamming WWE for their titles not meaning anything and having no prestige because of it. Building off a, like, a genuine sentiment from the Vince era and reframing the attempts of re-establishing title prestige under Triple H as a character beat for the big Austrian. Because of course, like on the telly, he's the one that re-established that prestige. He was the champion under that era. He saved the Intercontinental Championship. For two years, the best of WWE stepped up, saying they'd defeat him, and all of them fell to the might of the ring general. Directly relating the way he won the IC title with ease, to winning the King of the Ring with ease, and then relating the lack of prestige to seeing it again with the top title on the show. The World Heavyweight Championship is a pinnacle that should be so much more, and at SummerSlam, he's promising to change the prestige of that championship. Which so perfectly set up the two lads having their face-to-face later on, one of my main critiques of Priest has been him being given generic promo material in the face of much more interesting characters for his opponents. So, how did he do with Gunter? I felt like this was finally something Damien Priest can really use <laughs> to get you invested in his match against an opponent. Because I saw some critiques saying that the bar here that they were using for Gunter was maybe just a little bit too low what they were doing with the uh, character note they gave him. However, the entire point is to get you invested in the Priest character, and this is the first time in his reign I've given a shit. <laughs> or felt like I'm giving a shit. My instinct wasn't to boo Gunter. My instinct was being like, oh, that's actually really good. <laughs> I was almost applauding it, not because of what it does for like the Gunter character, but for what it does for the Damien Priest character. One of my main things is that I've been struggling to be invested in his matches. Now I have a reason to want to see him beat Gunter, and it now means something more if he loses, because I've been expecting Gunter to win the entire time. And for me, that's still the way to go for Gunter to win. But now that loss has some meaning to it. And there were so, so many like little great bits from Gunter here, like using just calling him, ladies and gentlemen, your world heavyweight champion. To be delivered as just such an insult. <laughs> as soon as he did that, I was like, I love this man. <laughs> he, just, he just said, he is your world champion. And just the way he says it, <laughs> it's just uh, it's, it's such an insult. He's been watching Priest since becoming King of the Ring, saying, good for you for living out your childhood dream and becoming a world champion in WWE. But in his assessment of the actual quality of the reign, your reign has been nothing. You've offered nothing. Priest, unfortunately, with some generic, I wish I was at Summer Sam so I could wipe that smirk off your face. But him bringing up the tough life he had to overcome to simply just be here was genuinely great character work. Which was the absolute perfect way to swing Gunter into the villain of the piece with the, let's face it, living on the streets is a choice. (laughs) Absolutely amazing line. Absolutely amazing facial reaction from Damien Priest. And and Gunter then trying to justify what he's saying when he hears the crowd reaction is such a perfect second beat to it, especially as the camera keeps cutting back to Damien Priest's reaction. Yes, you have to focus on uh, Gunter as he's trying to uh, be like, hey, hey, hey. (laughs) But Damien Priest had such great facial reaction to everything Gunter was saying after it. And such a great line mirroring Gunter's privileged life against Priest's tough road. Priest had to fight and claw and prove himself. Whilst Gunter's badge of honour is that with him, WWE are the ones that came begging for him to sign with them. Priest with a right mug on him after that. You are and always will be street trash. I don't know if that's a phrase in America to say he's got a right mug on him. (laughs) 
That doesn't mean that he's had a drinking container pushed to the right of his right of his face. <laughs> anything. No, no, no. It means he's got such a face on him, <laughs> like a grumpy, rumpy mug. <laughs> anyway, a nice promise from the champion that when he remains El Campeon for the first time in Gunter's life, he'll know what it's like to have nothing. Suddenly, there's a promise of we'll see a consequence for Gunter as well. So we've got consequences for both characters of Oh, are they to lose? Not just a motivation for them to win, so we could see that world of the possibility if they win, but they're also painting, painting the possibility of the worlds for when they lose. And literally, what I talked about earlier, as if it was purposeful foreshadowing, wrestling is at its best when it creates multiple roads. And whatever avenue it takes, it doesn't really matter because it's convinced you of those roads being the right one to go down, or at least an interesting one to go down. Here they are creating two interesting roads. However, I've seen this on television before. <laughs> Finally, some genuine character for somebody. Right at the death. Wait, they're not tea-dogging him, are they? <laughs> Giving him some character before he gets his brains chomped down on by a zombie. <laughs> oh, not <enough>, Damien. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> But well, that's a good nice little uh, twist into uh, Dim Priest versus Braun Strowman. Tying up that loose end that's been bubbling with the Judgment Day through the summer. This was when it really hit me a quiet, the crowd was. That this was your world champion wrestling at the top of the hour, and it got smatterings. The point of it all was to give Priest the opportunity to show his fight in front of Gunter, and in the end, South of Heaven to the Brown Straw Man for the win. After the match, Priest shaking off Gunter's chop for amped up lampings, but holding his chest as he chats shit to his challenger afterwards. So even though he's talking shit, they, they, they did have an effect on him. Moving on to Bo Dallas, who was called out by Chad Gable. Uh, first off, Rowan's spooky VHS interview with Uncle Howdy was great. Well, as great as a lad opening up about picking himself back up after grief can be. He lost a brother, and just when he got himself back up, he lost his other brother. The line of, I'm just Rowan, who's gonna miss me, was so, so impactful during this. Ending on a somewhat positive spin with it about him seeing the group's purpose as fixing broken hearts. Just, you know, uniquely, because he's doing it with a big hammer. <laughs> Gable out acting like Bo being Uncle Howdy is a big reveal, but calling the man out was just a big distraction. As Chad Gable officially gets his baddie stable, the Creed brothers in suits to beat up a man. But whilst that happens, Bo Dallas is just laughing there in the ring whilst he's taking their beating. Eventually, the lights go down, piano on, the bonus of a quiet crowd is getting to soak into this atmosphere instead of the time getting bleeped out for every single time the word shit is said. Get it, go, go, America. For the first time, the friends come out to the ring. The baddies curtailing it as Bo poses in the flashing lights, he and his friends peering over the lantern with his maniacal laugh. It's a nice transition for this stuff to become physical in front of them, which I felt like was sometimes a bit of an issue trying to find how do you do the Fiend character outside of this era like outside of the Thunderdome mirror, where it's actually in front of fans, live fans. I don't think they ever fully figured it out. But I feel like transitioning it into the physical stuff a lot more, so you're actually out in the ring a lot more, is a really, really strong way of doing that. And our main event, the Intercontinental Championship, Sami Zayn versus Ilya Dragunov. Gunter's words about bringing prestige to the IC title nicely echoed by us seeing this, that same championship main event on the very show he said it. The promise of Breaker in the background as these two landed lovely lamps on each other. Another 10 minutes to dance, but it was more than enough to give Ilya his big showcase. A great way to establish Sammy's words about no longer being the underdog, treating him like a champion the week after he divulged in calling himself such. No surprise these two were great together, even if Takeshita has ruined everyone else's blue thunder bombs. <laughs> it's, it's like Darby Allin and Dives, like no one else should be allowed to do them now. An exploder suplex accidentally working as a brain buster. See, that was actually an accident, not the one that's at WrestleMania, you internet idiots. <laughs> but Ilya's matches have a habit of escalating into an exchange of last second knees and kicks halting an ultimate demise. The top rope sent on, blocked and rolled up for a damn near fall from Sammy though. Sammy really booked to feel like the champion full of heart. Haluva kicked to an apron dragon as them both on the outside, awkwardly just stood there hugging, waiting for Breaker to make his charge down and around the ringside, because they've got to get that high camera angle. It's become a thing to make sure we get it every show now, charging around the ring, spearing Dragonov, and getting a DQ as we set up our possible triple threat for SummerSlam. Because maybe that's how Breaker wins the title. I don't know, in my mind, you just have Sammy beat. <laughs> Breaker just wins the title, and maybe you have him versus Dragonov next week. And then you can do Breaker versus Dragonoff for the actual titles down the line. Other notes, Drew McIntyre got his opportunity to convince Adam Pearce to lift his suspension so he can face CM Punk at SummerSlam. Pearce said yes, but making it very clear the time for pettiness is over. Because if he makes the match official, it's time for business. Just asking him to apologise to the referees that he attacked. Just say sorry, because they put their lives in danger and you endangered the referees. So just say sorry, Drew. 
Uh, but the Scot was not able to hold his cool, his suspension staying, and then Seth turns up to make his night even worse and him even angrier. Seamus has a new generic Death Rebel beat. Weep for Lobster Head has fallen. Reed was a reckoning, so it wasn't long before Shamro himself had been felled. Pete Dunne coming out afterwards, attacking Seamus, and then Reed do a splash after that. Zena Vega got her interview interrupted by Sonya and friends, getting in some good snaps. I couldn't hear you over your forehead. <laughs> it did actually make me laugh. Because it's nice to give someone an emotional win before they lose in the actual wrestling contest. Deville got her wee little return showcase. Party Girls and Valkyria with the post-match beatdown save. Later on, the party girls were accompanied by Lyra to face Stark and Baszler. This show had a proper lull in that second hour. <laughs> that's that's where you had the joke of all oh, oh, killer, no filler. Uh, yeah, again, <laughs> one night more. That second hour started off with the Damien Priest match, which that's when it hit me how quiet the crowd kind of was during the World Champions match. And then after that, it's like, oh, if they're quiet for him, get ready for this little baby. <laughs> get ready for it. And poor Lyra Valkyria as now the ringside companions <laughs> in this in that feud to get over Sonya and Fens. Anyway, that was the week of WWE. Monday Night Raw had very little wrestling on it. It was very much so where I don't feel like that's an, as big an issue for WWE as it would be for AEW. Because AEW, the wrestling is the focus. That's the entire point of the promotion. It's so strongly put around there. Whereas in WWE, it's still like the centre, a holding thing of, of everything, of every single thing they're saying. But there's so many other things around it that it's not as big of a deal when you have a show full of promos. Sure, Monday Night Raw might have killed the crowd because of it, <laughs> or something. It was a more tepid Monday Night Raw, which did some really important character work going forward. So what we saw on this Raw, even though the crowd were a bit quiet, even though there wasn't really much wrestling on it, they did a lot of character work on this show. It's just that the difference is in AEW that will be told through the matches, whilst in WWE it's told through promos and it's established that way. Two very different worlds. You critique them differently. You can't critique them the same way. And anyway, I'm going to get my wrestling fill because the G1 Climax starts this weekend. <laughs> it's eating time, brother. <laughs> Meets back on the table, boys. But I'll be back this time next week to talk about Raw and SmackDown. Even though I'll be watching AEW and G1, like, you can still hit me up on... I'll be up on the Discord. You can hit me up on X to talk about all that stuff. Um, when I say I'm trying to be a bit more active, I've ended up just, like, retweeting my friends. <laughs> so, if, if you're my friend and you want to be retweeted, you can follow me on there, at the damn Cat. I use it very, very differently nowadays. And with that, I say thank you for listening, liking, engaging in any form, any manner. Always appreciate it, never take it for granted. I'll be back next week. With that, I bid you adieu. Adios.